Josh, you're coming up with so many interesting things about what's going on inside her head. You and other researchers are coming up with a picture of how, how we come out with the things we come out with. And I would think a lot of juries and judges and attorneys in courtrooms would really want to make use of yeah. if they could. Is it ready for them to make use of, or, or, or can it cause harm? It depends on, 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 on the issue. So there are some things where, where, where understanding what's going on in the brain is, is, is clearly relevant. I mean, if someone commits a crime, but they have a giant tumor that's impinging on a part of the brain that we know is involved in decision making, that's something that people certainly want to know about. And you make a good case mm. that it's something they yeah. ought to want to know about. Yeah. When it comes to our understanding the detailed processes about how decisions are made. I feel like there, we're, 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 we're really just in the, the infancy of, of, of this discipline. But, you know, nevertheless, I think un understanding what's going on in people's brains when they, when they make decisions, you know, that's, that, that's an important thing to try to understand. And there are some things that are, that, are, that are, we can get a pretty good grip on today and other things that are, you know, we're just beginning to scratch the surface. Is there anything now that we know about how the brain works and what we can see in imaging as the brain does its work that ought to be brought into the courtroom, mm. in your opinion? Well, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's certainly relevant if, if, if someone has a mental, has, has, has neurological damage of some kind mm. that impinges on their decision making. Um, but then this, this raises you know, broader philosophical questions about well, why does it matter? And if that kind of thing matters, what else matters, yeah. right? I mean, if, yeah. somebody, if somebody commits a crime, to take a real example, there was a, there was a case written up in the, in the neurological literature where there was a man who uh, had never had any uh, prior uh, a record of engaging in pedophilia and, uh, and then was living with a woman uh, who was married to and his, his stepdaughter, the woman's child, and he uh, was making advances on, 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 on the daughter. And, uh, and it turned out that he had a brain tumor. Uh, and, 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 uh, but this was not known at, at the time. And while he was being detained, he was actually making advances even on the, the nurses in the hospital where he was being examined. He really seemed like he couldn't control himself. And then uh, they found the tumor and they removed the tumor and he was fine. And then he started acting up again, uh, and and the tumor was back. Oh, and, oh I see. and they removed the tumor, right? And there, you know, that's a case where I think we all intuitively feel like he's a victim of his tumor, right? Um, and and uh, and but then the question is, you know, what's the principle behind that, right? When do we say uh, that this what's going on in your brain is an excusing condition, right? Uh, and the problem is that anytime somebody commits a crime, uh, well, there's got to be some causal explanation for how, how, how they did it. So, um, for instance, if, they, if they're very impulsive, right. and they, they're, they're the controlling part of their brain, the right. prefrontal cortex, right. is not exercising enough control, right. then, and if you can show that, then right. I guess you could say, my brain made me do it. Right. So put my brain in jail, but I'm okay. Right. So that's so, so it's interesting the way you said it, my brain made me do it. Yeah. Uh, put my brain in jail, but not me. That's a very natural thought, but it's a thought that we have every reason to believe is based on a false premise, which is that there's ultimately a me that is distinct from my brain, right? <laughs> and you know, you think of your brain as you said something as, as something you have, right? You don't say usually. I mean, a philosopher named Thomas Nagel famously said, "I am my brain." But it's, it's, it, we chuckle, because it sounds funny to say that. No, I, I'm a person, and a brain is, 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 is an important part of my body. Right? So you're saying, right? I am my brain. Well, or... we, have every, we, have, we have no reason to believe that there is any me left over once, once you get rid of the, of, I, of the neural process. And yet processes. it seems as though there's an effect right. of the brain when it operates, a kind of emerging um, um, system, which we call the mind, yes, which is seems to be different from the brain. Right. I we, mean, at least it se it feels different. Seems right. different from the inside. What we're aware of are our perceptions. We we feel things in our bodies. We see things out in the world. And we're aware of thoughts and intentions, and we're aware of the movements that we 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 voluntarily engage in. Um, but we don't we 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 don't have a we don't have the sense of being a mechanical system. I mean, the brain mm -hmm. is essentially a computer. It's, it's important in different ways from the computer that sits on your, your desktop. Uh, but nevertheless, it is 
cells that are neurons that are computational elements that 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 when one neuron fires and it, it's firing makes other neurons fire and it's firing makes other neurons fire I mean if you trace take a voluntary action so if I say to you Alan please raise your hand and you know you're a nice guy so you do do what I ask you if it's a reasonable request so if we trace that back right well what happened you had uh, muscle muscular contractions in your arm that caused your in your shoulder that caused your arm to, to, to go up and those that happened as a result of signals that came from your brain well what caused that to happen uh, other signals in your brain, other neurons firing, making the neurons that control your arm fire. And if you trace that back, all you're going to find are more physical events. There'll be brain events, and then beyond that, there will be events in your past, out in the world. But there is no, nowhere will you find, as far as we know, any magic line that's crossed when you get to the self or the soul or the mind that is causing your arm to go up. It's all just physical stuff starting with the physical muscles in your hand and the physical neurons that innervate your muscles and the, and the physical neurons that uh, make those neurons fire and so on all the way back, as far as we know, all the way back till before you were born. We, we feel like we are immaterial souls or minds distinct from our bodies, distinct from our brains. Uh, if that's true, the evidence has been very hard to find. It seems like we are fundamentally physical beings and it just happens that it doesn't feel that way to us from mm -hmm. the inside. If that's all physical, right. and if you can, through more and more research, yeah. read what the physical pathway is yes. to behavior, yeah. like lying, right. then that would have a gigantic effect on the justice system, or would it? Well, so I think there are two ways to think about what neuroscience can do for the law. One is you take the law's current conception or people's intuitive current conception and say, within that framework, what can neuroscience do? And then there's the question of, if we really understand the neuroscience, are we getting a new framework? So let's start with the first thing, right? Okay, the well, first we, one is what? The first one is, we're not having any big philosophical shift. We just want to know, can neuroscience give us the kind of information that we're already looking for, right? And so neuroscience, you know, right now, you, you can tell if somebody has a big brain tumor that's causing them to behave in an illegal way. And we say, OK, you had a brain tumor. You're excused. It's not you. It's your brain, right? Yeah. It's not you. It's that brain tumor, <coughs> right? You take the tumor right? out and then we're right. okay. But now, suppose we say, well, OK, it's not a brain tumor that you have. It's just some more subtle condition, some genetic predisposition. Like to being, being an adolescent. To, like being an adolescent or being, or being impulsive yeah. or, 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 or having a, difficulty making decisions under pressure or whatever it is, you know, what is it about that tumor that excuses? Well, I think an intuitive answer to that question is, well, the tumor's not me. It wasn't really me. It was this external thing mm -hmm. that caused me to do this, yeah. right? Yeah. So then the question is, well, where is that line between me and external stuff? But when you look in the brain, there is no such line, right? I mean, if there was a problem with your health otherwise healthy neurons and as a result you know just the way they happen to be wired together because of that pattern of wiring unique to you you made this terrible choice and now you're in on on, on trial why why is it any less your fault that you have that pattern of neuro, neural wiring than it would be if you had a brain tumor i mean to take this to the most take this line of argument to the most extreme right forget about neuroscience for a moment just think about physics so you're Take, take the simplest of decisions. You're at a restaurant and you're offered a choice between soup and salad, right? And you decide, well, what is the ultimate cause of that decision? Uh, there was the state of the universe, say, 10,000 years ago. There's the laws of physics marching along. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and then perhaps there, there are random events at a quantum mechanical level that also influence things. Those three things together, as far as we know, are sufficient to determine everything how the universe started, or at least what it was like a while back, the laws, and randomness. And you don't ultimately control any of those things. You, know, you don't control how the universe was before you were born, or what the laws of physics are, or things that are random. By definition, you don't mm -hmm. control. They're random. And that's enough to determine what you choose to do. Um, so you say, well, if it's ultimately beyond your control, then can you be fully responsible for it? But this isn't an argument that applies to just certain individuals with certain brain problems. It's, a, it's an argument that applies to everything. Now, there are a couple ways to resist this, right? So one is to say what matters is 
not that you are not ultimately responsible, because of course the universe is ultimately responsible, so to speak, for everything that happens, but that as long as you reflected or you had a, made a conscious decision or something like that, as long as your rationality was not compromised, then you're responsible. Um, well, okay, but you know, take take so take take uh, you know, take take someone who uh, was 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 uh, raised to be a, a, a racist, let's say, right? And they fully embrace uh, the racism that they were that they, they, they were raised with, um, and they're, they 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 consciously endorse it and they think about it and then they're rational, um, but you know they didn't choose. That upbringing, right? Uh, if you could, if you could have predicted with sort of ninety-five percent accuracy uh, that they would end up being that, that kind, of, kind of person, then do you want to say that they're really deeply responsible for for, for what they did? Um, now, on the other hand, of course, for practical reasons, we have to hold people responsible for what they do. I mean, it would be utter chaos if we said there's no consequences for you, no matter what you do, because no one's really uh, guilty of, of anything. And so, this gets to sort of two different rationales for, for, for punishing people and for holding them responsible for what they do. And on the one hand, you have the, what I just articulated, the, the consequentialist or utilitarian rationale for punishing people, which is basically, there'll be a lot more bad stuff done if you don't punish people. If you don't, if you let people, if you don't punish people, then they won't have any incentive to not do the bad things that they might otherwise want to do. Um, and I don't think anyone disputes that there's a good practical consequentialist rationale for punishment. But another rationale for punishment, which the law takes very seriously, is known as retribution, which is that we simply, part of why we're punishing people is just to give them what they deserve, right? And well, retribution sounds more, more like getting even. In a sense that-, so that you, you take that from me, I'm gonna twist your nose. Right, except that, that you know, in our legal system, it's not the, the victim necessarily who, who, who gets to do the twisting, right? Yeah. So the state does it. And when, when, it's, when it's not you getting even with the person who wronged you, that we call revenge. But, but more and more, it gets to be like that, where you have the victim right. able to make an appeal to the judge mm. about, look what this man did to me. Right, and, and certainly victims play a role in the process, yeah. and, and that's I think, always been an important part of the process. But retribution, right. you're defining more as giving the person what they deserve, which is punishment, essentially. Right, but it's punishment that's, it, what makes it retribution is that it's, it's not, uh, that it's punishment over and above or independent of whatever practical reasons there are for punishing, right? So we might punish people to keep them off the streets. We might punish them to deter them. See, this is what will happen again if you do this again. Mm -hmm. Other people, you paying attention, this is what will happen to you if yeah. you do it. All of those reasons are, 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 are essentially utilitarian reasons. They're yeah. forward-looking reasons about preventing future harm. But punishment that goes beyond that right. is retribution. Is retribution where we say, you did this bad thing and you deserve to suffer because of what you did. Now, right? what really interests me about this is uh, right. the scientist in Switzerland, uh, Ernst Fair, yes. F-E-H-R, mm -hmm. who, as far as I understand, correct me on this, says that he's found centers in the brain or a center in the brain yeah. that lights up as a reward yeah. when we punish people for committing a transgression, or yeah. I guess what we regard as a right. transgression. Right. Well, that, to me, sounds like um, an, an extremely important question to consider. Yeah. When we outline punishments at the, at the legislative level before right. we ever get to the courtroom. Right. You know, the three strikes and you're out, right. life in prison without um, parole, right. or you get into the courtroom, he did it, make him pay, that, yeah. all kinds of uh, punishment that may be coming from the simple source that we get a reward in our brain when we exercise it. Right. This even goes down to corporal punishment in the family. Right. Well, that that sounds like it takes this whole argument into another direction. Yeah. So I think that what those results speak to is essentially that, that our social behavior is largely driven by automatic processes that have a kind of rationale, but that themselves may not be fully rational. So. So the rationale is added later. Yeah, so, well, 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 or, or rationalization, yeah. but I, I actually meant a genuine rationale. So take, take the example of, of, of the relationship between food and hunger, right? Yeah. We evolved to eat and to find food appealing. Well, you could imagine creatures who 
would say, we could figure out what their physiological needs are and say, well, based on how my body looks, I'm going to need some protein and I'm going to need some carbohydrate and I'm going to need some, uh, some, some water. And as a result, go and choose the things that are going to be good for your body. Well, that's not the way nature does it. What nature does is it just makes you hungry. And it makes you hungry and want to eat certain things that at least in a, in a natural context are going to be nourishing for you, right? And so, uh, you know, Hunger is, 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 is sort of physiology is executioner, right? That your brain needs certain things f physiologically and hunger is the proximate psychological mechanism and, and your tastes are the prox proximate psychological mechanism that make you go out and do the things that at least in most contexts are good for you. How is right? this like punishment? Here we go. We have a taste for punishment, right? That when we punish people, the research suggests if you ask someone, why do we punish? They'll give you a consequentialist answer. They'll say, well, it's for the greater good if we didn't punish people. But, but and this is, I think, what, what, what Ernst Fair's study suggests, um, as other research does as well. That's not what really immediately motivates us. What motivates us when someone commits a transgression is we get angry. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. And, right, we get angry and we have a motivation to punish that person. Yeah. And we find it satisfying when we do. Yeah. We stick it to them, right? Yeah. And, that makes sense in the same way that it makes sense to uh, to have a feeling of hunger that makes you want to go out and eat this. Well, thing, wait right? a minute. I don't get that connection. It makes right. sense because it feels good, but right. I don't see that it makes sense in the in the broad scheme of things. Over time, right. if, if we behave that way, pretty much we get down to an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which right. for a long time was. Right was inscribed right. as right. a way to and do it. And if you follow your food instincts, you might end up shoving Twinkies into your face 24 hours a day in the modern world, right? Oh. So, so, oh. so the point is, is that our, 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 our instincts, whether it's in the domain of food or whether it's in the domain of punishment, have a, they're not random. They make a kind of sense, but they can also mislead us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it, while, while, while you can imagine how it would be adaptive for individuals to have a kind of taste for punishment, you can also imagine how that taste for punishment can, can, can go awry or, can, or be, be suboptimal. And so bringing this back to your original question of you know, what, understanding, how, understanding that we are mechanical systems, right? What does that do to our thinking about these things? What I think happens is when you see humans as physical systems, the practical need for punishment never goes away. So no one's saying you can't, you shouldn't hold people responsible. No one's really guilty, and therefore, any, you know, no one is legitimately punished. But what I think it does is it undermines that taste for essentially revenge, that taste for for for, for retribution. Um, that uh, what undermines it? Understanding that every every human behavior is essentially a, a, a set of physical causes going all the way back, 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 back to, 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 to before, long before you got to, to, to that uh, event. So if you right? understand that, yeah. then you're less likely to just strike out with revenge. Right. I mean, you don't get angry well, at what a machine do you do in the same of way. Revenge? You... Think, what I'd say is you think about the costs and benefits. You say, what is a good policy mm -hmm. for cases like this? And you adopt the policy based on your, its expected effects rather than what you find emotionally satisfying. So a long time ago in this conversation, we talked about two, two ways of looking at justice. Yeah. Have we moved into the second way now? Right, well, oh, so, so, so two ways, one is consequentialism and, re and, and retribution or retributivism. Oh, I think we, and the other that, was, we were talking about yeah, right, So now we're into the second way, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That is, you can think of neuroscience as helping the law do what it's already trying to do without any real philosophical shift. So the law wants to know when people are telling the truth, maybe neuroscience can help us detect lies. The law wants to know if somebody has some brain disease, neuroscience can help, can help us figure out if they have some more subtle kind of brain disease. But then there's this larger philosophical question, which is if what philosophers and some scientists have been saying for centuries is true, and neuroscience is kind of increasingly incrementally confirming this, that we are ultimately biological machines, that we're ultimately physical systems, and that we're, our behavior is ultimately caused by a combination of our genes and our environment, and not by some magical decision that happens in the soul independent of the physics of the brain, right? Does having that realization change the way you think about 
freedom, punishment, and responsibility. Does it? What do you think? Well, it's an open psychological, empirical question. Mm -hmm. My hunch, and there's some evidence to support this and some evidence uh, against it, is that it does. That is, when you think of somebody as a product of their genes and their environment, ultimately operating through the physical mechanisms of their brain, you may recognize the need, the practical need for punishing the person because it will affect their future behavior, it will affect other people's future behavior. But the desire to stick it to them, I think that goes away. So what do you, how do you feel, how do you answer yeah. the person who says, this is a slippery slope, mm -hmm. you start seeing all of the steps that led up to this behavior right. and begin a little bit to excuse them. You don't give them the right. punch in the head that they deserve. You right. do some more regulated um, punishment. Right. It's a slippery slope to letting everybody do what they want. Right. So how, how, how do you not make it a slippery slope? There are two slopes. <laughs> Everything okay. comes in twos. There are two slopes. <laughs> it's the yin, yin, yin. There are two slopes. And one is slippery, and we should slide all the way down it, and the other one is not. Okay. Right? And the slope that's not slippery is the consequentialist slope, the utilitarian slope. What gives us justification for punishing somebody is that if we don't punish them, they will be more likely to do this in the future. Other people will be more likely and to do this And we know that to be true? I mean, or, we, or is that just a guess based on our desire to punish because it feels good? Uh, I think we can be pretty confident. It's that, a so, kind so, of... so, so for example, there have been times when, when the police have gone on strike, for yeah. example, right? Yeah. And, and, and crime goes up when that happens, yeah. right? I mean, you, you know, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you want to do experiments with in the real world, precisely because we're pretty confident that if you don't hold people responsible for what they do, at least some people will okay, start doing so bad that, things. Let's say that that settles right. a certain amount of uh, punishment right. is useful. And that slope's not slippery at all. We can say we have full moral justification to, 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 to have a criminal justice system that punishes people for doing things that, that we don't want them to do. Uh, for the sake of deterring others and also to keep people off the streets who are dangerous even if it restricts their freedom in a way that they don't like. That slope's not slippery at all. The other slope, which is quite slippery, is, 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 and which some people think is the whole slope, is, is the whole mountain, right? It's a one slope <laughs> mountain, uh, is the slope of intuitive justice, right? And what people do see is they say, my goodness, if this brain stuff keeps going the, and, and people start interpreting it the way, uh, the, the way they are, where, well, a brain and tumor will excuse that. Well, what about a gene that predisposes you to violence? What about a gene that makes you more impulsive? What about this? What about that? What about that? Then eventually we're just going to say everybody's excused. Now, there's an alternative view here, which is that full responsibility really comes from just having the right kind of psychology, by being rational, essentially. And so well, let's try a little thought experiment to see which of these seems right. This is not definitive, but I think it's, it's worth thinking about. So imagine you have uh, a, a, a set of very high-tech uh, human engineers, and they decide that, that they want to create uh, people who are going to do some bad things. So they scour the human genome looking for genes in the normal population that are going to predispose people to criminal behavior. And then they raise those individuals in an environment that is going to be conducive to producing criminal behavior. And lo and behold, 95% of the people uh, in this little world where they have been raised to, uh, to, 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 to be in the kind of environment, let's say, you know, they're exposed to a lot of violence and maybe they have broken families and so on and so forth. You sort of create an environment that doesn't guarantee criminal behavior but makes it more likely. And you pick genes that don't guarantee criminal behavior but make it more likely. And as a result of this social engineering, say 95% of the people uh, who grow up in this little or big human petri dish end up doing bad things, right? Uh, now the question is, do you want to say, are those people fully responsible for the bad things that they do? Mm -hmm. Do you feel yes, no, fully responsible? Not somewhat, but fully. No, I would say not, not fully responsible. Right. So I have the same intuition. I think a lot of people do as well. Um, and then here's the catch. Replace the evil engineers behind this with just the normal course of history, right? Some people, they have the genes that they have. They have the environment that they have, and they end up being the way that they are and doing what they do. It seems that when it comes to the deep responsibility of those individuals, the fact that it's 
some evil neuro or genetic bio social engineer who's creating this world, is the fact that it's someone from the outside intentionally doing this is irrelevant. From the point of view of the person in the world, they are the way they are, whether that world is just the natural world or the world in this hypothetical thought experiment. And so if we want to say, if you were raised in this giant biosocial petri, petri dish by someone who intentionally tried to make you the way you are, we say you're not fully responsible there, why should we say the person who just lives in that world naturally is fully responsible? We're all just products of our genes and our, and, and, and our environment. Now, someone who grows up in this petri dish and ends up being a nasty piece of work, they may be dangerous, you know, keep them off the streets if they're in a position to harm other people. They may respond to punishments, right? Um, they, uh, th th and so there may be practical reasons for punishing them. They may respond to other people's getting punished. They see other people who are getting punished say, okay, I better not do that because I'll get in trouble. They may be fully conscious and rational about what they're doing. They just say, yeah, I know what I'm doing and I just don't care about other people at all. And that's what their environment and their genes, uh, ultimately, that's how their genes and their environment led them to think. So it's not that they don't know what they're doing. They can be psychologically identical to your prototypical deserving criminal that is deserving of, of punishment, right? And so the, the lesson I take from this thought experiment is that our conception of freedom and our conception of responsibility is not a purely psychological one. It's not just about knowing what you're doing. It's not just about your ability to, to, to choose, your ability to respond to incentives. Will I be punished or not? That we have the sense that there's a kind of deep self and that you are, uh, and, 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 and that we, we want to punish you for being bad. But when we understand that everybody is ultimately a, a product of, of forces beyond their control, I think that that melts away, or at least withers to, to a large extent. That is, when it comes to the people in the Petri dish, we recognize that they may be dangerous and that we can't just let them do whatever they want, but we don't feel the urge to stick it to them in the way that we ordinarily do. Except that we also are the product of everything that made us. That's the point. And so, we uh, have the impulse right. to do what Ernst Fair observes us doing, right. which is sticking it to them. Right. And when enough of us get together to form a Congress or a jury, right. we can stick it to them. We can. And we can stick it to ones that we never even met yet. Right. But should we, we can say, if anybody right. does this thing <laughs> that we find reprehensible, right. we're going to, not only will we stick it to them, but the next generation will stick it to them. Right. I mean, we really love this, yes. this ability right. to do it. Right. But one of the things that's most important about the human brain is that we're not slaves to our automatic instincts, right? So to go back to the food analogy, you know, you can be on a diet in a way that an animal can't, right? Mm -hmm. Animals don't say, you know, I really like that corn feed, but I'm getting a little big around the middle and I don't want to look that way, right? <laughs> the a animals are, 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 you know, you could argue about dolphins and, 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 and certain apes, but for the most part, animals are just instinct machines, right? I think one of the things that, that distinguishes humans from every other species on Earth is, 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 is our ability to stop and reflect on what we do and ask, does this really make sense? Is, it our, is our ability to stop and reflect or our belief that we have an ability to well, stop and reflect? I think there's good... Do there's we good, really have that I think distinctive thing that we, no, can, there's we good, can change? There's good evidence that we can do this. So let me give you an example from the food domain. So there was a nice experiment done uh, by Baba Shiv uh, where it had people who were on a diet and uh, they told them they were participating in a memory experiment and they told them to uh, and, 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 and they were going to go down, down this hallway to, to go to the next part of the experiment. And uh, along the way, they said, oh, there's a cart where there are snacks available, and you should take one of the snacks. And some of the people were told, uh, were told you have to remember this number. It was an easy to number to remember. It's like two digits. Others were given like seven or eight or nine-digit number. It was harder to remember. And on the snack table, they had fruit salad. The ones who had the longer number right. took the snack. They took the right? chocolate cake. They, right? They, so yeah. so there's, there's fruit salad and chocolate cake. Because their control right? center was occupied right. and couldn't work on exactly. their... Exactly. So their, we, we have... Lo and that's just one of gazillions of examples. We know that humans can... Are, 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 you know, with, with the animals, it's just all give me the chocolate cake. Right? <laughs> um, but with humans, we can say, you know, I, I, I like the chocolate cake, but I have, there are other things that are more important to me yeah. down the road. Right? Uh, okay. and, and so we know that humans do have this ability to reflect. Do we always use it? Absolutely not. Do we sometimes use it for nefarious purposes? Absolutely. But 
I don't think there's anything written into our nature that says we can't stop and think about who we are and why we are the way we are and take that knowledge and, 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 and apply it in a way that, that serves our ultimate goal, at least a lot of our, our ultimate goal, of making societies I, I, I as happy wanna, and healthy as possible. I don't want to box you into a corner. Sure, and, 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 box and, away. And <laughs> I don't, I don't want to <clears throat> box myself in yeah. by proposing that we have no self-control or no will whatsoever. Right. But it really does seem to me, from watching the world operate and yeah. the years I've been around, yeah. that there are so many factors that lead into our behavior yeah. that are not conscious on our part. Yeah. Let's say, for instance, we all have yeah. free will about how we dress every day. Mm -hmm. We can make up our own minds about that. Yeah. I have never seen anybody choose to wear a toga in the street. Right. You don't live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, no. obviously. <laughs> Do they wear it here? You, you see everything. No, but yeah. there was a time right. when you never saw anybody not wear a toga. Right? Some places, sure. So, what I draw from that is that the people around you create right. such a powerful influence right. over some of your actions yeah. that there, there are probably many, many actions right. that we assume are decisions, are yeah. the result of decisions on our part, right. that are really just dictates by the culture, right. by what's just happening in the culture at that moment. Right. Long hair, right. beards, no beard, short hair. Right and you can divide people up according to their political thinking, right. depending on these choices that they've made, yeah. which are maybe choices and maybe not choices. Right. So I think that's absolutely true, that most of what we do is kind of automatic, and in some sense, mm -hmm. we're just going with the flow around us. But the flow changes. The culture does really evolve. And in my view, part of what makes it evolve is people actually thinking. Um, so in, even in your own lifetime, right? I mean, you've seen the civil rights movement progress, where you know ar arguments that people seriously made during your lifetime, uh, 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 you know, for example, are, uh, opposed to inter interracial marriage, right? I mean, now that's off the table, right? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I don't think it's just random cultural drift. Um, and, and here, a, w a wonderful discussion of this is in, is in uh, Steven Pinker's recent book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. What, what, what he argues is that while it's true that most of our decisions as individuals are we're just kind of going with the flow, there is a rational, critical element in our culture that pushes things along. And it's, it's, it's not an accident. You know, if you look at a, a graph of people's attitudes towards uh, interracial marriage and opposition to it, it just steadily, 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 steadily goes down, as, 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 as has been going down. Uh, and that doesn't seem to me to be random. So here's an example. Most people will never invent a new technology, right? It's not something that we do all the time. And yet our world is dominated by technologies that didn't exist at some point in, in, in human history, right? So as long as reflection and reasoning can accumulate, as long as it's not random, as long as once someone makes a good argument, it's a little bit more likely to stick than to disappear, then over time, we can have dramatic changes in the world that we live in, even if any given individual on a typical day is just going with the flow, right? And you um, think this can actually, does any research that you've done or you know of point to the fact that changes like this, right. either individually or as a society, right. Can occur as the res as a response yeah. to a rational argument. So there's or, really or very you, are we led by right. other forces? There's very little research on this, and what what I and and my graduate student Joe Paxton are trying to do is to test this in the lab. So oh. we're we're running an experiment now where we try to convince people to to to, to not eat meat, um, and we want to see can we uh, can 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 well, we're going to give people what we think are pretty good arguments, and we're gonna give people what we think are pretty lousy arguments, but that kind of sound superficially good. That's a control condition, right? And, uh, and we'll see, can we actually get people to override their current tendency with a good argument as opposed to, 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 to a bad argument? And you know, the history of the world doesn't turn on this one experiment, but this is an example of the kind of thing you, do, you could do as a scientist to actually sort of try to catch this process in action. I wonder if you, um considered this other, just one of the other elements that I'm, that I'm trying to 
wonder about here yeah. in this conversation. What if, regardless of the arguments, you surround them by people not eating meat, and you sur or you surround them by people just crazy to eat meat? Yeah. You know, uh, my guess is there'd, there'd be a, or if they're even just exposed to that right. before they go into this test, they might be right. more susceptible to the arguments against eating meat right. if they, if maybe, or they watch meat right. eaters in a disgusting way. Right. You know? Yeah. And so I think that this is why progress is slow, or has is at best slow. Right? Is that you know. Nine, ninety-five percent of what we do, I mean, this is just picking numbers, ninety-five percent of what we do is just determined by our absorption of the norms that surround us. For, and if, probably for good right. reason. Yeah. If we had to make a rational decision right. about everything exactly. we do, right. it wouldn't be possible to get out of bed. That's right, exactly. And so we go with the flow. Yeah. But if there's a little bit of rational reflection, and the fruits of that little bit of rational reflection, even if they're very small fruits, uh, if they can accumulate over time, if, 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 if a good argument is a little bit more likely to be influential than a bad argument, then over time, good arguments can accumulate and culture can change. I mean, it's just like, think of it, it's, it's really quite analogous to biological evolution. That is, thinking, that yeah. if you look, you know, if, 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 if you look at something like, uh, you know, the, the, the evolution of, 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 of any you know, important, important biological change. I mean, take the take the, the shape of the of, of the human body compared to our nearest ancestors. You know, these were probably just very small incremental changes where an individual who stood up a little bit more upright had a little bit more of an advantage. You know, you just had a, a half a percent more likely to successfully reproduce as a result of this little tiny change. But as long as there's a direction to it, those little changes can accumulate. And eventually, you've got a whole new species with a whole new way of life. And you know, things can happen even faster, but still kind of it feels imperceptibly slow on a, on a on a cultural scale. And so, you know, it doesn't, you know, a hundred steps forward, ninety-nine steps back, over the long haul, moves you forward.